Coming to you straight from the Rio Grande and beyond. And beyond. Broadcasting to the four corners of the globe. So grab your seat, your coffee, or your sundowner. Okay, everybody, here we go. On point, as always. This is Gloves Off. Gloves Off. We're back at you in Gloves Off. I'm Paul Buitron. I'm here with a great friend, Warren Johnson from Dallas. And we're just going to touch base on podcasts and just a little bit of everything that's going on in North Texas. How are we doing, Warren? You're doing good? Doing great, man. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. And I love what you're doing. I love the, the uh, how can I say, the news and the updates on the political spectrum over there from the, the North Texas side. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think everybody here in Texas, we all need to get together and literally band up behind somebody that's going to get us through. I'm into it. Absolutely. Well, let's touch base on, you had a podcast, didn't you? you uh, we started out, uh, I ran for Dallas City Council, and after recovering from that, I uh, wanted to keep that momentum going, so I was able to get touch base with some guys that had some, te- I have no technical knowledge. I'm a 20th century man trying to get by in the 21st century. So I had to hire some guys to, uh, to do it. And we did about six months worth of weekly shows, of about 10 minutes each. And uh, just, kind of, just kind of went out on the internet uh, and YouTube. And it's under wildwestwarren.com. You can pick some of the old ones up there. But then COVID hit and the two guys, you know, they didn't want to do it anymore. They were scared. So we just kind of stopped it. And so that was probably April of last year, a little over a year ago. So the wise men encouraged me to crank it back up. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm going to tap into your, your knowledge about doing this to kind of guide me, guide me along. For sure. Any, any time. And, and we'll get it going because I've seen some of your shows and some of them were pretty interesting. Yeah. And I, I remember, uh, in fact, uh, I clicked one on when I was driving with, with my kids. We we're going to, uh, to Goliad. We we're going to show them a little bit of Goliad. Yeah, talking about Bonnie and Clyde, and a lot of people don't know that Bonnie and Clyde are from Dallas. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that was one of my, I think a podcast of mine that you saw. Actually, um, the reason I made it uh, was because there's a group of people that wanted to have Clyde Barrow's father's gas station, which is on Singleton Avenue in West Dallas. Sure. declared a, uh, you know, have a, a, a historical marker put on it. And I, you know, I was uneasy about it. I'm a, I'm a big historian. You know, I've had some historical markers designated in certain places. I've done some, that kind of thing. It's kind of a avocation, I guess they call it, or a hobby. A minor did it in college, read about it all the time. Uh, that's, that's the kind, I don't read novels, I read historical stuff. Uh, so I started researching, I found a lady, uh, a story about a, what, the last people that there's two cops, the last two cops that Bonnie and Clyde killed was up near Grapevine. They ambushed them. And uh, actually the cops drove up on them. They were sitting on the side of the road. And when Bonnie and Clyde got out, you know, they started, they started firing and killed these two motorcycle officers. And Bonnie actually blew one of their heads off, which was this guy. So uh, I, I made a little video about that saying, you know, these, these Bonnie and Clyde are made out to be heroes. And they're more like celebrities, mainly because of the movie that came out in 67 with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. Sure. And uh, but really, they, they were punks and thugs, and they were robbing gas stations. I mean, they weren't like going into down. They were doing nothing brave. They were doing nothing like Dillinger. They weren't going in guns a blazing and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars out of banks. They were robbing gas stations and getting 20 bucks, 30 bucks. And these gas stations were owned by, you know, some poor guys in the middle of the, the Depression. And, you know, 1932, 33, and 34, and that 20 bucks was all that gas station owner had to feed his family. So, you know, like I say in the video, I mean, they were robbing from the poor and they were keeping it. So I was, but yeah, I got to know, I mean, we're from, my dad was born in Fort Worth, uh, 1924. So Bonnie and Clyde were doing their stuff in North Texas and throughout the Midwest in, uh, you know, when he's about eight, nine, ten years old. So he, you know, he was aware of them. And as I was growing up, he would tell him about it, tell me about it, because I was asking things about the history of Dallas and all these places. And 
he uh, he didn't call him Bonnie and Clyde. He called him Clyde and Bonnie. And that's the way most people refer to him. But then the movie comes out and everything changes. But I first became aware of this in um, 1966. I was living in North Oak Cliff and I was a Boy Scout. One of the things, uh, you know, I was 11 years old. And one of the things we had to do were these community service projects. So we found a, a graveyard nearby. It was a pauper cemetery where the poor people were buried. And it was really overgrown. I mean, it was badly overgrown. You could hardly see any of the gravestones. And so we cleaned it up really well. But we found there was Clyde Barrow, Petstone, and he's buried next to his brother, Buck Barrow. So you know, I told my dad, and he said, oh, well, yeah, look here. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's that. Now, of course, they were killed in Louisiana in 1934, and they weren't buried together. Bonnie's buried uh, over in the cemetery, actually not far from where I live now in Turtle Creek, uh, kind of close to Love Field. Uh, so they never were buried side by side, as Bonnie said in her, uh, in her uh, poem. So, uh, so that's, that's, where that, that's where that story. So yeah, nobody seems to remember the, uh, the victims. They killed so many people, and I want to say maybe close to 20, if they were doing this stuff nowadays, they'd be considered mass murderers rather than folk killers. But some people Absolutely. just they get they get wrapped up in the celebrity of it. You know, uh, I've seen I've seen that I've seen that cemetery. I was I was taken the, at one time. Somebody was trying to start a tour, like um, like ghost ghost watchers, and they they took a little bus, and we went in that bus, and it was a radio station that, that yeah. started back back in the nineties, and I saw. Uh, where uh, Clyde was buried, but they never took us to Bonnie's graveside, you know, and uh, yeah. they showed us a couple of houses that were apparently haunted near the Turtle, uh, Turtle Creek area near, uh, near, I'm trying to say Hall Street, downtown there in Deep Ellum area. Yeah. It was just one of those little tours that you go inside oh. and you run around and go to the different areas. You go see, uh, uh, where Kennedy got shot in the library and all that stuff. And, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I've got a little bit of, I live in a high rise on Turtle Creek. Okay. It was sure. built in uh, the early sixties. And uh, the, the grand opening was done in January 31st of 1964. All right. So in 2014, we had a 50, a year anniversary opening celebration, you know, and I was on the historical committee and we were uh, going through some uh, old newspaper clippings and we found one clipping from the Dallas Morning News in the mid 1980s written by I think Kent Biffle. And he was writing about the fact that on the day that he shot Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, Jack Ruby was supposed to move in here at 21 Turtle Creek is the name of the place. He was supposed to move in here. So it's like, so they, they had a, you know, when they opened up the building in the, in the late sixties, they had a soft opening, you know, okay, well, people can move in, but we're not going to have a celebration until then. But yeah. So on the day, so rather than move in, he had to go to jail. So we never got him as a, as a resident. So it's my little touch of history. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. You know, and, and it's still there. It's uh, Dallas has a lot of history. Dallas has a lot of great stories like that. There's way too much, too much for people to forget. Yeah, well, you were, uh, you said you owned some uh, uh, restaurants, I believe, in the Irving area, some other property, and probably nearby. Uh, and I guess maybe you'd moved away by then. That uh, right over there off Beltline in 183, where that uh, cop got shot by the Texas Seven. You know what I'm talking I had, about? I had, already, I had already left. Well, my, my school used to be off of uh, Beltline and Conflance and at one time yeah. it was on the same shopping centers as Hooters. And, yeah, and yeah, I, was always, was I was always within that Beltline area before you go into Grapevine, before you go into Grand Prairie. Yeah, I know, a little, a little further south, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that was, uh, in fact, his mother, uh, Aubrey Hawkins was the officer's name. His mother lived actually on Turtle Creek too, down the road from us a little bit. And she died about uh, 10 years ago. And she was a fairly young woman when she died. And she's probably about my age, so. Was, were there any relation to Chief Hawkins from Dallas? Police Chief Hawkins? I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. Didn't, 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 didn't read any of that anywhere. But. Yeah, he was, he was a good police chief. We, they don't make him like he. 
good yeah, we have <laughs> – the police in Dallas is another big issue as well, man. We got – oh, God. Um, you know, I, I, as when I was running for city council in 2019, I, I, I was coming back from knocking on doors. And it was – I'll never forget this. This was March 16th because it was the day before – uh, St. Patrick's Day, when everybody gets drunk, okay? But St. Patrick's Day that year, 2019, I believe it was on a Monday, so everybody was out partying on Sunday the 16th or something like that. So anyway, so we're driving back down Gaston, and uh, you see these this couple on a, one of these little electric scooters, not sitting down, but the kind you stand on, okay? And Gaston is a four, for those who don't know, Gaston's a four-lane, uh, fairly busy thoroughfare. And all of a sudden, they're, they're up above, oh, three or four car lengths in front of us, and all of a sudden they just take this tumble, put out in the middle of it. So I pulled up behind them and they, and the guy, and this lady was laying in the street. She was out cold. She had blood all over her face. She had a pothole in there, of course. And um, that's something I was making hay about out there during the, during the campaign was how bad the streets are. Uh, so anyway, so I call about that same time a nurse uh, who was off duty or whatever had just showed up. So she was tending to them. So I got on the phone and started calling 911. I got put on hold, put on hold on the emergency number. I was there on hold probably for about 10 or 15 minutes. I thought maybe there was a technical problem. So I, cause I knew 911 to answer right away. So I hung up, called back, went on hold again, literally about another 10 to 15 minutes. So for almost 30 minutes, we were on hold. So that whoever was non, had no idea if this was a loud noise call or if somebody was breaking into the house with an intent to kill a, a, a woman and her two-year-old child huddled in a closet. So, and we've had that problem for a long time. And, and now we've had the city council that wants to defund the police. Uh, we finally got one councilman, the one councilman that's in my district, we finally got him to change his tune. Uh, when we ran a good heart, I ran as conservative, only got about 12% of the vote. Uh, again, like I said, but I threw it into a runoff and the incumbent got defeated. We had another, but I, it was just me and about $35,000 and my wife, who was the door knocking fool and a phone caller. We were able to at least get that much. This other lady ran, she put a lot more money into it. She had another, uh, a, a good team working it. And she was able to get through it in the runoff again too. She was able to get about 25% of the vote. Uh, so uh, running as a strong conservative and pro-police. So we got the incumbent who was with the group to defund. We got him to turn to make a 180. So now all of a sudden all his, uh, his, his flyers and such are talking about, you know, I'm pro-police and I want the police. We did have a shooting in our parking lot a couple of days ago, like 1.15 in the morning. And again, we called 911, went on hold again, but we're only on hold about a minute. And to the cops' credit, they got there within about five minutes. So we're, we're on the upswing, but the, we still got a lot. To, I asked, I know some of the cops, and I asked them, when was the last good police chief we had here in Dallas? And the one, this one cop said, Click was the last one. And I guess he was here about the time you were here. And I think he left about the time you left, about 20 years ago. I uh, know that the last one from, from Dallas was Hawk, uh, Hawkins, eh? Is that, is that one you remember? Mm -hmm. When, when was remember. that? 96, maybe, 97, 96? Uh, the click may have been a little bit later. The click may have been early 2000s. Sure. Probably, he probably came in afterward. And um, I was gone in 2000 from Dallas area. And Dallas is a great place, you know. I, I, yeah. I, I great friends over there, and you all are up there. But, well, uh, it can certainly be that way. I mean, it's just, it can it's just... Be. that You know, and Laredo's a beautiful place as well. But you know what's going on? What? Is changing the tune a little bit. And I know you're much into politics. It's... We elect individuals out there that are not fulfilling their duties. And they're becoming more self servant than anything else. And yeah. that to me is the problem. Well, and that's what I got involved with this election. You know, we're having elections again this year. Uh, you know, about six weeks ago, we had the general election, and now we're in the middle of the runoffs, which are on Saturday, is the runoffs. Uh, and we had a lot of incumbents that uh, are in a runoff. So, you know, if they're not winning outright in the, in the general election, then they're, you can tell a lot of people are unhappy. But anyway, so I've gotten in that mode again. And once the dust settles from this one, we'll see how it all plays out. I'm gonna try to put together another group of people 
and we're going to kind of be a watchdog outfit. You know, I got a Facebook page called Dallas Watch, and I just try to keep the focus of Dallas on there, watching Dallas, watching Dallas politicians, watching crime, that kind of thing. And I want to focus on getting or finding the net worth of an incoming council member when they first start and then what it looks like when they leave. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of development going on in Dallas. And so we got the feeling there's a lot of scratch changing hands depending on votes. So, you know, it's, it's like the old ad, it's follow the money. So I think anybody can do that in any municipality. As you and I spoke earlier, I think uh, it's like you call it, La Cosa. What, what, when I write that down? Judicial Cosa Nostra. Judicial Cosa Nostra, that's, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's something that I have right now, and, and that's what I've been looking at. And I've been seeing this for the last, I would say, maybe 15 years. Yeah. You ha we elect magistrates. We elect judges, both the county court, JPs, district court. Uh, appell courts and then all of a sudden you show up and there's associate judges folks oh. that you, you do not know their political choice you do not know which way or who they are and they're basic when you start paying attention to them you have some that have been there for 20 years yeah. you have some that have been there for 10 years you have some that, you know, they outlive some of these judges that we actually elect. Mm -hmm. Some of them end up becoming two-term judges, and all of a sudden the associate's still there longer. Now, we have no idea who they are, right? Yep. But what we do have and what we do understand is what I'm seeing, especially in Webb, in Webb County, is either they're, they're, they're families into politics or they have some a family member that was either a past uh, – a public elected official, or you ha they have some type of political influence, and all of a sudden they're there. But they're the ones that do the dirty work for the elected public officials. You see a case, maybe it's an abortion case, um, and I'm you know, this is something we'll talk about right now in, in abortion, is they're actually supposed to let you know because some of these associate judges are voting on a, an abortion, and they're actually supposed to let you know by law, and they're not, a lot, and they're not doing that. It's not surprising, I hate to say. Okay, and not surprising, right? So for all those women out there and for all those pro-choices and everything else, start looking into that. But here's, here's the problem. You have a contested case or one that can become politically powerful case. Yeah. The, the public official is going to say, I can't do it. And they hand it over to this associate mm -hmm. who does whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. He can bypass the, uh, he can pass the buck. You understand what I'm saying? I, my, my hands are clean. I didn't do it. Absolutely. So, you know, we need to stop that. You know, if, if these judges cannot, and their excuse is always, we have too many cases, we need another associate judge. Well, if you can't do it, resign. We'll elect somebody else that can. Yeah, totally agree. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah, totally agree. And most of these associates get paid nearly the same as the one that we just elected. And we have no control, and we the people have no control over them. Yeah, and they don't campaign very well. They just put their, you know, say, hey, I'm an attorney, and I went to this college and this law school, and that's all you get to know. We tried to campaign for a, uh, a district judge here in Dallas County in 2020, and we called into her. There's a little group I put together, and we ca called her in and, uh, you know, said we want to help you out. want to campaign for you, but, and we were kind of giving her some thoughts and ideas. But she pretty much said, well, I can't say that. I can't say this. Can't do this. Can't, can't, uh, you know, pronounce, you know, how I feel about these certain things. So the judges don't campaign. They just put it out there. And so you get the same old people again and again and again. So, and typical of Dallas County, which is about one third conservative and about two thirds liberal, then, you know, it ends up being about 67 to 33% the liberal gets the vote. And guess what? And um, conservatives aren't voting. And they aren't, but that's another thing, you know? And but we kind of ran, when I ran for city council uh, 2019, we got, you uh, know, I was campaigning as a conservative because you you, it's a nonpartisan race. You don't run as a Republican or Democrat. But some people that were helping me go door to door 
said, uh, you know, instead of using the, the, the list, the door knocking list you get from past voters, they would just go knock on door to door to door. And they're saying the reason we don't vote is because we don't, you, you guys don't run anybody that's conservative. So there's a, definitely a, there's a communication gap there that the word's not getting out. Right? And uh, as you saw on this Facebook page that we, we've both gotten onto here recently, um, that uh, some people are afraid of arguing about, you know, politics and afraid that, you know, we all need to stand together. Well, that's true at one time, but we still need to be able to discuss and get the word out and, and challenge. And, you know, if, if you can't be challenged in a, in a primary, there's no way you're going to be able to hold yourself up in a general election. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that page that you're talking about, I've seen some interesting stuff because now, um, they're placing in their folks that are running against Abbott. Right. Okay. And through the political spectrum, through the political grapevine, you start hearing names, you know, mm -hmm. you start hearing, of course, you have uh, our governor Abbott who's up for reelection. Right. You have Alan West who's, they claimed as m might run. Yeah. You have Chad Prather who's, I think he's already put in he's his. Declared. Name, yeah. He's declared. You have the senator from Dallas, what's his name? Huffins. Huffines. Don Huffines. And um, who's declared? Sid you Miller. Have, you have Miller. You have uh, I think uh, Matthew McConaughey, which, you know, his name's been thrown around a whole lot. Who else is out there? Uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, I think that's really it. For now, and it's still early. I mean, they, they got plenty of time to, I mean, we're still more than a year away. And sure. we still got redistricting to, to 10 weeks. Let, let, me, let me put it to you this way. When Trump ran the first time, yeah, I was sitting down, we were talking with a bunch of folks, just talking about politics in general. Yeah. And everybody said, oh, he's going to run. He's just crazy. He's, gonna, he's not going to win. Yeah. And I told him, I wasn't, I wasn't for Trump then. Okay. Yeah. And I said, you know what? He has popularity behind him. Yeah. You know, he's a multimillionaire, a billionaire. He's not an idiot. Yeah. He knows what to do. You know, he knows how to bring people together. Right. He's done it before. I mean, he can negotiate. I said, you know what? He's going to win. Watch him win. He's, he's the one that's going to win. Everybody, no, oh, you're crazy, so on and so forth, and blah, blah, blah. And guess what happened? He won. He won. Yeah. And the he guy took was... He took out nine, what was it, 19 of the Democrats and, and, and uh, Republicans together. He just went through them like hot knife through butter. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and now, this election, we can discuss if, it's, if, it's, if it was stolen, whoever, whoever want to believe or who was fraud done in there, we all know. But the one that has popularity on the Republican side is Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, <laughs> and he hasn't even declared whether he's uh, conservative or liberal. You know what I'm saying? So if he if he throws his name in the hat, he's a dark horse in the race. Yeah, I mean it's going to be an interesting primary season. I mean it really is. Uh, and I and these celebrities kind of concern me. You know, I like Matthew McConaughey a lot. I really do. Uh, he's a good actor. He seems, seems like a good guy. He's, I'm a I'm a UT grad. He's a big Longhorn fan. So you know all that stuff. We're we're sympathetical, but uh, I don't know. You know he doesn't have the, in my opinion, he doesn't have the the background or the experience to. Well, like you said about Trump to negotiate. I mean, it's great that he's a, a non politician coming, which is Trump's strength. He was exactly what the founding fathers envisioned were citizens coming in to do a little bit of tour duty and then go back to their job. Uh, and Trump had built an empire. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He built an empire. Some say, well, he inherited daddy's money. He inherited some money, but boy, he built it. All right. So he was his own. You know, man. let me tell you something on that. You know, yeah. you know people say, oh, he, his, his father gave him 14 million, but he made billions. You know oh, what it, it takes to take a 14 million and turn into billions take savvy and know how yeah. how many people do we know that all of a sudden they scratch something and they become billionaires because they won the lotto in the next yeah. two years they're already bankrupt it was nothing exactly 
even Hollywood Henderson, the Dallas Cowboy linebacker, won the lottery twice, and he's still broke. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, number one, Trump did it, and he's he was great at it. He was, a, he, in my opinion, he was one of the best presidents we've had. And um, unfortunately, it, the election was swindled away from him. But you're saying something here. Matthew is not a politician. Yeah. If he can, and, and, the, and here's a lot of people don't understand. By the design, by the Constitution of the state of Texas, agreed upon and passed in 1876, the governor is a very weak position. Among sure. the 50 governors, Texas is like about the 43rd strongest. They're way in the back of the pack. Absolutely. All he does is sign bills. He's got a line item veto. He can do that. But other than that, that's pretty much all he does. The real power belongs with the Absolutely. lieutenant governor. Absolutely. Okay. And that that's where, so this focus on Abbott, okay, that's fine. All right. So that means people like Matthew McConaughey and, and even Chad Prather can, can probably be a governor and be okay at it is because the guy doesn't do anything but line certain things out and signs, signs bills. That's what makes them law. The real the real power is in the lieutenant governor. That's what the focus needs to be on Patrick. Uh, Absolutely. Because I think he totally. And he, and he needs to go. He does. He rolled over and just turned it all over to, to Abbott. Abbott just had the strong, stronger personality. I mean, the greatest, I think, the lieutenant governor we ever had was a Democrat, and that was Bob Bullock. Mm -hmm. uh, from God, he was 25 years ago. I mean, he was a great lieutenant governor. He had his problems. I think he had a drinking problem and a marriage problem, but he, he was he was a damn good lieutenant governor. Yeah. You know, that's what we need. We need a strong, uh, we need a strong lieutenant governor, mm. and we don't have one right now. We have one that plays politics, and we our main concern is actually who are we going to throw against him? Who's going to run up against him? Who's well, running that's, against? Him? That's a good point. You know, yeah, who's I, running against him? That's where the power is because the governor is really just. To cut ribbons and to kiss baby butt, baby butts when they, yeah. when they come into there. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much. Yeah. That's it. You know, unless, you know, I just had this thought, unless we can get a governor in there that could tell Patrick to man up and start doing your job. And if, if Patrick is afraid to pull the trigger, then have a good, you know, governor to say, hey, this is what I want you to do. Do this, this, and this. You know, that's, that's an option that was just, just entered my mind. But for right now, I can't think. And usually somebody that becomes lieutenant governor is like a dark horse. They just come out of nowhere. You never knew any, anything about them. And sometimes you end up with, you know, like we got now. And I think Patrick got in there because he was a little bit of a celebrity. He has that radio voice and he was a radio commentator. Um, so well, let me tell you something about Patrick. Patrick needs to go. Uh, Ken needs to go. And so does uh, Abbott. I'm yeah. in full agreement with that. You know, I tell folks this, you know, I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur, I have small businesses, and I have several small businesses. I've always done it for myself. And we had a Republican governor that tried to destroy my livelihood. And we had a Democrat mayor that tried to destroy my livelihood during this, during the Wuhan flu. So to me, when the people say you have to vote straight Republican or Democrat, no, we have to vote for the one that's going to be convenient for you at this yeah. point. Same here. Yeah. Republican governor tried to throw me out of business and had a, have a Democrat mayor up here who same way. You know, that's Abbott totally, that's, that's another thing I can't believe we didn't discuss in this Texas legislative session, which was uh, the disaster, Texas Disaster Act of 1975. That's where Abbott literally, it was meant for hurricanes and tornadoes and that kind of stuff, which we have to go into an emergency when the place is utterly devastated. This had nothing like that, and how Abbott was able to get away with this it just completely baffles me. It, uh, I mean, one of these days there's going to be a book written on how we all got suckered into this. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I believe the flu is real. I believe it's deadly, but they just handled it all wrong, and they just took away all our livelihood, made us all poor, and, and took away our freedoms. Someday somebody's going to write a book about that and how Abbott also took over the state and become a tyrant. Uh, because I think he exactly was a tyrant. Absolutely. And you know that uh, the Democrats haven't thrown anybody out else. Here's what worries me. I'm in South Texas. Republicans have forgotten about South Texas and Webb County for decades. Um, you have Beto coming into Webb County, becomes a registrar, voter registrar, him and his crew. And every other weekend they're out here gathering votes and giving out pizzas and hamburgers and everything to yeah. all the people. 
and I have yet to see one Republican candidate try to come to Laredo, except uh, Alan West when they had the Republican uh, meeting over here, whatever it was called, the, the, the meeting that they had down at the Posada, and they were they were just they were told off by a bunch of pinko commies that were in the in the thing, and they were called yeah. white supremacists and so on and so forth. And I saw I saw no backbone, so I'm like. That's, I totally agree with that assessment, man. I, I think that's exactly what happens. Democrats give the devil their due. They work and they work hard and they don't mind getting their hands dirty. They don't mind going after, they don't mind meeting people. They don't mind sharing a pizza with them or a hot dog. Republicans tend to want to be entertained. Just let me sit back and you send me a video or let me sit in an audience and I'll clap and you make me feel good. I, and who, I was trying to think it was another, um, person I, I was thinking of that uh, was a good hard campaigner uh, and would get out there and press the flesh uh, but but it's they're not doing that anymore and I think that's everybody says well we got to be more like Democrats well in that respect I think oh there's a book that's what I was going to tell you there's a book I read about 25 years ago called uh, Hardball it's written by a guy named Chris Matthews he used to be on M MSNBC and he worked for Tip O'Neill, who Tip O'Neill was a Democrat congressman from Massachusetts during Reagan's area. I think he was Speaker of the House. Uh, but, you know, and there's, a, there's a, a theory out there, there's no thy enemy, right? And so that's why I was reading that book. But there's a line in there that said, all politics are local, meaning no matter how high are you up, whether it's U.S. Senator or what, you need to be on locally down there talking to the voters Door, knocking on doors, going one to one, and getting the crew doing that. So I, you know, if you ever get a chance to read that book, it's called Hardball. That's a great okay. book. Yeah. There's another. I was talking to another podcaster out there, blogger. His name's Jay St. John. Great guy. Great, great views on politics. If anybody hasn't uh, seen his, he's from Laredo, and now he's out down the valley. We we're touching base about three weeks ago, and he goes, "You know, Paul, they wrote a book on Webb County." politics and how they steal votes in ballot box number 13. Oh, that was the, that was the Duke of Duval, man. Duke of Duval. And I said, and I said, you know what? Yeah. And he goes, the way they steal votes here in, in Webb County, that's mm -hmm. the way they've been copying it and taking them elsewhere and into Chicago and other areas. And I said, you know what? You're probably so because here in Webb County, it's bad. Hey, I'll tell you, the candidate uh, running for city council here sent out a flyer to everybody and on it had two tear off sheets, two tear off cards that you can mail in. It was to request because if you're over 65 and I'm, I'm 65, you could request a ballot by mail. One was already filled out with all my information. Another one was blank for me to fill out the information. Okay. So I thought, you know, I was, I was totally against voting by mail, but I said, well, let me just send this in and see what happens. So I sent the card in. I got the ballot, all right, I held on to it for a while. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I was thinking about maybe even sending in the other car to see if I got a second ballot, but I didn't want to get accused of voter fraud. You know, usually somebody like me would also, would, would be found out. I, I never can get away with anything. Um, so I sent it in and I got the ballot. Uh, and finally said, okay, I'm going to mail it in. So I mailed it in. Like I said, I live in this high rise. There's 350 units in here on 23, 24 floors. And we got a mail room downstairs where all the mailbox boxes are. And there's, you know, sometimes every now and then somebody will get a letter that's not supposed to go to them. So there's this little box that sits out there, a clear box. You put a letter in there and some, you go through it and said, okay, it went to 504 instead of 702. Well, I went down there one day to check my mail. And lo and behold, there was one of those ballots sitting in that slot. For anybody could have come and picked that ballot up, taken it, uh, Signed it, it out. voted, yeah. and sent it. So it's it's out there. I mean, it, it really is. It really is. But we're coming back to your podcast. You should get back on your podcast. That's yeah, something you should work forward to. And go forward and talk about the politics that are in that area. Talk about the history. And interview the candidates. Do that. All right. Well, I'm going to, uh, since you're the professor, I'm going to count on you to, I'm going to come to you for class from time to time. Tell me how to work. Like I said, I'm a 20th century man trying to get by in the 21st century. So I'm going to need some guidance and help. So if you'll help me, I'll do we'll, it. We'll help you out. We'll help you out. And, right. you know, I'm not a savvy on, on tech savvy, but I've, I've made my mistakes and I've learned the way, you know, on the way. Right. And I've seen others. And, 
it's not that hard, but, you know, I think you can get, get there with uh, some equipment that you'll need. And I think and that's the way it should be done. And I'm going to tell you something about podcasts. All these shows, including uh, Prather's show, because, you know, he, he does some good stuff on Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, he touches a lot of people and he's done very good work, is that um, th this is how Facebook is, is censoring truth and what's actually happening. And the more that we expand, mm -hmm. the more we can battle that. Get that word out, absolutely. Okay, because the, the, regular, the regular media is not going to cover that. And they don't. It, and they don't. And, you know, so, you know, so that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And if people want to find out about a small business, like I tell people on, on, on Gloves Off, you want to come over here and talk about your mm -hmm. business and how you started it, come out here and explain mm -hmm. it. You know, we want to get to know you. You have a small restaurant. Come on out here. I know how hard it is. I've had them before. I've had restaurants before. I've worked yeah. in restaurants. I've seen people battle and, uh, you know, trying to make ends meet and, and how it's going on. And I know the way it is. You know, I know advertisement costs. You know, I tell, I tell, tell the folks, you want to talk about your business? Come on out here. We'll touch wow. base. Yeah. Touch base, you know, and... Um, but, um, and I interview, I started interviewing the candidates because it, uh, it started out as a hobby, what we did. Mm -hmm. And I started interviewing one. We've had debates, local debates, and we've had from city council to commissioner debates to mm -hmm. some judge debates, the mayoral debate. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've had them all. We held them for two elections consecutive. I'm going to do it a little bit different now that it's open. We're going to have mm -hmm. it uh, live and we're going to, we're actually going to, bring in an audience. I already found a place. That'd be great. And uh, we're going to start bringing in there. I kind of have a little, people can buy tickets for it. And I think it's going to be great, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I did the debate was because mm -hmm. the Webb County Democrats had a debate and it got uh, very violent with amongst themselves. Yeah. And some lady, <laughs> called, some, and some lady called and said that she was manhandled by certain individual from another camp and so on and so forth. And, wow. and one, of the can one of the candidates said, Paul, why don't you do a debate? And I said, sure, let's do it. Let's take, let's take a vote. So I'm a uh, you know, proponent for against bullying and all that stuff, as you can yeah. see in the, in the back. Yeah. And um, that's just the way it is. But cool. of course, we'll get you started. I'd like to uh -huh. see that. And more of the history of what you and what we need in Texas history. Yep. Totally agree, yeah. man. Because those shows are great. Mm -hmm. And once more, what was the name and the website you can go to? Look at those shows. Which ones? Yours. Oh, the names of my website? Uh, yeah, it's Wild West Warren, W-I-L-D, and then West, W-E-S-T, and my first name, Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N. That's wildwestwarren.com. And I've got probably six months worth of once a week, so whatever the math works out to, videos on there. A lot of them covers a lot of local politics, obviously, during the elections, but sure. I've got that one, just like I said, Bonnie and Clyde. I got some other things about uh, COVID was just coming on, so we were covering some of that, so uh, some good stuff there. I got another, if you're on Facebook, I got a page called Dallas Watch. That's some, uh, you know, go in there and like that. Uh, we get some, try to get some good information there as well. So you put your shows back on there, and we'll share this one away, and uh... Thank you again for your insights and also for keeping us abreast of what's going on, on on the north side of things, especially with politics. And listen, all the candidates that the names have come up, I wish them well. Yeah. You know, uh, the thing is, is are you going to be able to gather enough votes to go into runoff mm -hmm. and then gather enough votes to win the runoff yeah. and then go into the general election? And uh, you have the popularity to beat Beto. And if you do, go for it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's hard work. There's no doubt about it, man. And you need some really good organization skills, and you're going to need the money. There's just no way to get around that. You're going to have to get the money. And the main, the main thing is we need to keep on informing everybody. So your show, number one, has to come back up. Mm -hmm. Please do that. Because okay. you have a lot of information in your area. Mm -hmm. And I think we need that. Great, man. I, I, with your help, I'll get it done. I appreciate yeah, for that. Sure. For sure. And um, one, one last time, thank you once more. And I'll leave you with this. Stay peaceful. Be safe. You too, and brother. You. You're welcome, and thank you for having me on board. All right. Much peace. Bye, right, Paul. Time. See you, buddy.
Today, in America, more than 5.5 million men, women, and children train in a martial art regularly. Bui Tarun Academy has been serving Laredo for over 30 years now. Our adult classes are geared for producing the best in you, teaching you street-ready techniques. With the arts of Savat and Kinpo, you'll learn the traditions of these sciences of combat as passed down professor to student. Bonjour, friends of Professor Buitron. The COVID-19 scare is almost over. Be sure to bring the kids back to the professor's training and help them build their bodies, self-respect, self-confidence, and self-defense. The professor is a very competent and amazing man of several talents, aside from being a lovable teddy bear and a funny man. Get back to the studios. This is Sam Booth calling from Phoenix, Arizona. Have a great training. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Manuel Osano. I've been trained in the martial arts for close to 50 years. I trained in many martial arts from different masters and grandmasters throughout the years from the 70s all the way to now. I've known uh, Professor uh, Paul Bitron for about 30 years. He has done the same, trained in many different arts with many masters. He's traveled all over France uh, studying with uh, surviving Salat Grandmasters, did his research. This man not just knows uh, the fighting techniques and the art, but the philosophy, the history and the strategy and applying this arts combined with all the other arts. So this man is a wealth of knowledge for anyone seeking instruction in real martial arts and street martial arts. This is the school to go to in Laredo, Texas. For those of you who are away from Laredo, this is the guy to look for, okay? He's very well uh, versed in all the fighting styles of the different arts he is trained in and would highly recommend the school. Hi, this is Mike Blackery from San Antonio, Texas, home of CMOC and the Wing Chun Boxing Academy. I'm here to tell you about my good friend, Paul Boutron. He is reopening his school in Laredo, Texas. Paul is a wealth of knowledge. I've known him a long time. I highly suggest everybody in that area, get with it, go down there and train. Times are getting tough here. And with this COVID-19, we need to support local business. So I highly suggest go see Paul Bhutan at the Don Zeru Sabat Academy in Laredo, Texas. You will not regret it. Be good. Come train at the best kept secret of Laredo. Give us a call for your free evaluation at 956-401-4868 or check out our website at savat.biz. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook. 